Calaroga Shark Media. From the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, home of tomorrow's debate, and my friend Shane, this is Ballot. Wait, does Shane live in the National Constitution Center? Or is he just from Philly? Anyway, nobody cares. Let's hit this. Let's start with Kamala Harris before you guys accuse me of doing nothing but goofing on Trump. And believe me, we're going to goof on Trump. It looks like Kamala Harris's campaign has hit a few speed bumps faster than you can say, would you like fries with that? First up, we've got the polls. Turns out, Harris's lead over Trump is shrinking faster than my patience in a DMV line. Nate Silver's model now has Trump in the lead, which is about as comforting as finding out your parachute was packed by a guy named Butterfingers. Then we've got the Gold Star families giving Harris a verbal beatdown that makes a UFC fight look like a tea party. And let's not forget the Israeli hostage situation. Harris warned Israel not to enter Rafa. And then, surprise, that's exactly where they found the hostages. It's like telling someone not to look in the cookie jar for the missing cookies. Oh, and there's the McDonald's controversy. Trump's claiming Harris never worked there, apparently thinking her fast food experience is as fake as a McRib's connection to actual ribs. To top it all off, Harris got caught doing the old I'm on an important call move to dodge reporters. Classic politician move, right up there with I didn't inhale and I did not have relations with that woman. So there you have it. Harris's campaign is having a week rougher than a $2 steak. But hey, in politics, two months is an eternity. Who knows? By next week, we might be talking about Trump's secret love for kale smoothies or Harris's hidden talent for yodeling. Seth Meyers joked about last week's Fox Town Hall with Trump, during which Trump criticized ABC News anchor George Stephanopoulos and said that his interview with President Biden was the softest interview I've ever seen. You're going to say that while you're being interviewed by Sean Hannity? I ask tougher questions when John Oliver is here. After Trump told Hannity, he couldn't imagine anyone in New Hampshire voting for Joe Biden. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone in New Hampshire voting for Biden. You know why? Because he's not on the ballot anymore. Well, folks, it looks like Donald Trump's legal troubles have gone from a tsunami to more of a gentle spray from a leaky garden hose. Who knew that delay, deny, and deflect could be such an effective legal strategy? I guess in Trumpland, justice delayed really is justice denied, or at least postponed until after happy hour. Remember when Trump was facing 91 felony charges? That's more charges than a teenager's phone after an all-night TikTok binge. We all thought it was game over for the Donald, but apparently he's got more lives than a cat in a bubble wrap factory. Let's break it down, shall we? First, we had the classified documents case. You know, the one where Trump treated top secret papers like party favors at Mar-a-Lago. But whoops, a Trump appointed judge just tossed that one out faster than a Mar-a-Lago guest tosses back overpriced cocktails. I guess when Trump said he'd drain the swamp, he meant he'd fill it with judges who'd have his back. Then there's the Georgia case, which gave us that iconic mugshot. Trump managed to turn his Fulton County glamour shots into a fundraising bonanza. Who knew looking like a disgruntled DMV customer could be so profitable? And let's not forget the election interference case. That one's moving slower than a sloth on tranquilizers. At this rate, we'll have flying cars before we see a verdict. In the end, Trump's strategy of when the going gets tough, the tough get litigious seems to be paying off. Trump just gave us a masterclass in how to turn a press conference into a one-man Broadway show. Move over, Hamilton. We've got Trump and American Fever Dream playing to a captive audience. Trump treated us to a greatest hits compilation of his grievances. We had impeachments. Hoax number one, hoax number two, coming soon to a theater near you. The justice system, more weaponized than a Michael Bay movie. And even a throwback to the Clinton era. I guess when you're running out of current material you got to dig deep into the archives. And just when you thought he might actually address, oh, I don't know, the economy or foreign policy, Trump hit us with a nostalgia trip about his days as a real estate mogul and reality TV star. Of course, no Trump performance would be complete without blaming the Biden-Harris administration for his legal troubles. It's like watching a kid blame the dog for eating his homework. Except, the dog is the entire Justice Department. And let's not forget the grand finale. Trump's pivot to actual campaign issues, a mere 40 minutes into his monologue. Job numbers? Check. Undocumented immigrants? Check. Lowering debate expectations? 
Triple check. Meanwhile, his advisors are probably backstage, frantically waving cue cards that read stick to the script and please, for the love of God, talk about inflation. All right, folks, strap in for a family feud that makes the Hatfields and McCoys look like a preschool playground spat. We've got a photo of some Walls family members, yes, that's Governor Tim Walls' extended clan, sporting Nebraska Walls for Trump shirts. And let me tell you, that apostrophe is doing more heavy lifting than a CrossFit enthusiast on steroids. Now, these MAGA Walls aren't exactly Tim's immediate family. They're second cousins which in political terms is about as close as Mars is to winning the Stanley Cup. But don't worry, Tim's mom Darlene, at the ripe old age of 88, is here to spill the tea. She's basically saying, yeah, that side of the family, they're the weird cousins we only see at funerals. Meanwhile, Tim's brother Jeff, down in Florida, is playing both sides like a political contortionist. He's all, I love Trump, but I'm not trying to influence anyone. Sure, Jeff. And I'm not trying to influence anyone when I wear my I Heart Bacon shirt to a vegan potluck. The Trump camp is having a field day with this photo. They're sharing it faster than a cat video at a retirement home. Even Donald Trump Jr. got in on the action, asking if the left-wing media will cover it. Well, Jr., we're covering it now, and it's about as newsworthy as your dad's latest spray tan mishap. But let's talk about that apostrophe for a second. Walls's? Really? It's like they're trying to win a grammar rodeo while riding backwards on a donkey. Keith Olbermann, ever the wordsmith, couldn't resist taking a jab. I mean, when your grammatical errors are so bad they're uniting the left and the right, you know you've really accomplished something. So there you have it, folks. A family divided, an apostrophe misplaced, and a political circus that would make Barnum and Bailey proud. Just another day in American politics, where blood may be thicker than water, but party lines are thicker than both. Stay tuned for the next episode of As the Walls Turns. Portions of today's program were made with the help of AI, the plural of which is AIs with an apostrophe S.